Welcome. My name is Andre Luko. I'm leading innovations and emerging technologies at the BMW Group IT. And together with Johannes Lepsch, <laughs> who is the product owner for quantum computing, we will be talking today about quantum computing at the BMW Group toward a practical quantum advantage. So hopefully some of you maybe have heard of BMW, right? We build premium vehicles. We roughly sell 2.5 million vehicles per year. Our vehicles are highly customizable, right? And those are some numbers that should indicate the scale of the operation that we are engaged in. Uh, so you, while we have 60 plus vehicle models, our customers can buy those models in billions of variants because they are highly customizable. We build more than 9,500 vehicles a, a day for doing so. We do have like 30 production sites worldwide from the US, Germany to China, and we handle more than 30 million parts per day. So as you probably, when you see those kind of operations, right, uh, you probably can see you know, why we are interested in quantum computing, because it provides ample opportunities for us to optimize or to deploy machine learning in our business processes, but also in our product. So quantum computing, we started to engage in quantum computing in 2017. I would like to point you to this nice circle on the left hand corner there, which is our technology radar, which is our tool that we use in order to track new emerging technologies. And in 2017, we started to identify quantum computing. And in 2020, we actually moved it you know, from the watch to the prepare circle of the technology radar. If you're interested in learning more about you know, what technologies we're currently looking out for, I encourage you to either go to the web page there or to use that QR code uh, because we just recently published our technology radar uh, in the internet so it's available for all of you to read. So quantum computing as we all know is an ecosystem play, right? It's a team sport. So it's not just us out of Munich doing quantum computing. Uh, we, as a matter of fact, have several teams, innovation functions who are working on the IT, on the R&D, on the vehicle side, but also in the production division on the topic of quantum computing. And every one of them has like a different perspective of the, on the topic of quantum computing. Uh, we also do some work, for example, in our other international tech offices here in the US, for example, uh, we work very closely together also with the MIT QSEC consortia, uh, but also in Tokyo, Singapore, and China. Um, maybe one more aspect, right? The BMW Group is a fund founding member of the Quantum Technology and Application Consortia. Uh, we'll talk a bit about you know, some of the use cases there because we do believe, right, uh, the ecosystem requires a strong application perspective, right? And a lot of the applications that, for example, industry has, no matter whether it's you know, mobility and transportation or whether it's, for example, the chemical industry are shared, right? And that's why the BMW Group, for example, is engaged in the Quantum Technology Application Consortia or short QTech. So coming back to quantum computing, why do we care about quantum computing? I mentioned our complex value chain, right? And those are the three main areas we are currently focusing on. The first one we call automotive business. And that basically includes all the optimization and the machine learning problems that we do find in our business. For example, right, when we're engineering the car, nowadays a lot of you know, AI generated methods are used in order to do so. When we uh, produce the vehicle, Right? We operate a highly automated production facility and uh, one of the most complex supply chains ever any industry has. And we'll see two specific examples uh, later on on how we actually use quantum computing to, uh, or think about using quantum computing to optimize our business operations there. Material science, I'm sure we have heard plenty of examples during this conference. Uh, how quantum computing will help us to solve exactly you know, those kind of simulations of sub-atomistic particles, molecules. And as an industry, we are just you know, in a transition from combustion engine to electric mobility. And there are ample opportunities, for example, to deploy 
new materials and the more fine-grained we can obtain an understanding of materials, for example, we put into our batteries or in our hydrogen fuel cells, uh, the more we can, for example, avoid doing expensive uh, experiments or try and error in the real physical world there. The same applies to numerical simulations. The automotive industry has been using high performance computing since decades, right, for crash, aerodynamics, and all kinds of simulations uh, because uh, they allow us, right, to improve the speed, right, uh, have a faster vehicle development and avoid actually uh, building up real prototypes. In order to do HPC, we currently operate a big high performance computing clusters in three locations uh, in Iceland, Sweden, and in Munich. We have more than 1,000 cores in those machines. And uh, obviously, uh, we're also deploying the latest and greatest accelerator technologies for accelerating those uh, simulations like GPUs, and hopefully in the future also uh, quantum QPUs. So much about the opportunities, and now the question is, how do we actually make it happen? Right. Yeah, thanks, André. So um, on the one side, right, we hear all these great promises and, uh, and fields of application and um, yeah, a, a great new world that, that is in front of us, right? On the other side, you might have uh, listened to many talks throughout the conference that uh, um, rather go in the direction that, you know, hardware is not ready, it's too noisy, it's too small, their algorithms are there, you know, there's so much to do, right? And um, so we're kind of, you know, in between those two worlds a little bit, right? On one side, we do the promise. On the other side, there's the reality of the matter. And, like, let's be honest, the elephant in the room is that there is no practical content of launchers as of now, right? So how do we navigate, basically, this field? Um, and so for us, we have um, set up a very clear uh, two-fold strategy. On the one side, we believe that uh, in order to you know, benefit from those great promises, eventually we have to understand very deeply uh, what you know, is happening on the lowest levels of those quantum systems, right? So we have to engage in fundamental research and um, in order to really squeeze out the last bit of performance of those NIST devices and even to you know, venture out into new types of algorithms, uh, have to find the right partners in academia and have to build up the knowledge internally, right? Which is why, for example, last year we uh, funded two endowed chairs in, in uh, you know, renowned German universities um, and really believe in this strong academic uh, footprint uh, that we want to leave out. On the other side, however, you know, BMW's strength is the application side of things, right? So we understand our business and we understand the problems that our business faces, right? So the other side of the medal is that we you know, try to formalize very clearly, very concrete business problems, and then try to see you know, what type of applications um, of quantum systems could be utilized to solve these problems. However, it is important to, to understand that we don't necessarily restrict ourselves here to you know, pure quantum solutions, but really are a little bit more, I would say, open with respect to the type of uh, you know, compute technologies that we will employ. We try to somehow benchmark things a little bit, right? To try to see what quantum could bring to the table, but you know, let's be honest, normally at industry scale, uh, there is not much you can do um, with quantum these days. Right, and this is basically the balance that we always try to find ourselves in, but it is, again, crucial for every new project that we start to clearly you know, ask ourselves, you know, what are we doing here? Are we trying to do fundamental research or is it really about solving a business problems? And both of these approaches need to be carefully distinguished and, and, and uh, are you know, completely different with the, with the way we uh, engage with our partners. Um, and, right. So this is quite, quite abstract. Let me try to give a couple of examples. Um, and for each of those, I'll, I'll try to see whether it's on one or the other side of the table. And let me start uh, with a promise in quantum generative modeling, right? So yeah. I'm sure all of you have, uh, have seen recently great images being produced by DALI, OpenAI, or you know, the great promise that quantum or that generative classic generative modeling brings. Um, on the other side, there's been some interesting advances in, in quantum generative modeling. You might have seen publications by um, you know, INQ and by Zapata and the likes. Um, and um, so to us, it seemed like these quantum generative modeling is something that is very naturally connected to quantum hardware in the sense that it is fundamentally probabilistic, right? You, you 
also saw that all the uh, quantum supreme experiments basically came from the fact that we tried to sample from complex random distributions. And at the end of the day, you know, generative modeling is nothing else than sampling from, from you know, trained complex uh, uh, probability uh, distributions. So what we did is in the QTech consortium that Andre mentioned um, uh, earlier, we collaborated with uh, 11 of our German industry partners and basically tried to um, compare different type of ansatzes, different type of data transformations, different type of training techniques and uh, try to basically see, you know, how good are we in overfitting uh, synthetic data distributions and how good are these algorithms in, in learning, you know, these probability functions. And, you know, it turns out normally if we get into these quantum proof of concepts, uh, the, 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 well, it's, uh, it doesn't take long for us to realize that this is really the wrong direction to go into, right? Because either, you know, constants are too high, complexity rises too quickly, or, you know, um, problem sizes are too small. Um, here, however, I mean, it's still, still very, very early days, but, you know, the first results that we, that we got were quite encouraging in the sense that if we restrict the, um, the parameter size uh, or space of the classical models, our quantum models were, you know, on par and sometimes even outperformed um, uh, the, 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 the classical counterparts. Right. Okay. So we are trying to understand what quantum modeling can do for us. Next question is, how can this be applicable to our industry, right? This is, at the end of the day, what is interesting to us. Good news is that, you know, quantum generative modeling and generative modeling, for that matter, has ample of opportunities. Um, not going to go into too many of the details, um, but one of the reasons why we do this in QTech is that, you know, this is applicable across all industries, basically. So we collaborate with, with pharma, with um, uh, um, uh, insurance and the likes, because, you know, um, just to point out maybe one or two examples, uh, if we understood the, the, the randomness in, say, um, yeah, in, 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 in probability distributions, we would be able to, you know, do, for example, CVAR calculations, value address calculations, risk management generally, um, obviously applications in generative design and um, uh, at the long uh, distance also in, in uh, material science are there as well. So let me maybe... One last sentence to this. So this is a classic example of where we try to see what is, you know, promising in academia and out there in the field, and then try to find uh, problems within BMW that might be applicable to these type of technologies. Another example that falls in the same category is uh, that of uh, utilizing QRS machines uh, for maximum independent set type problems, um, where, you know, uh, same, same promise, you might have heard actually in, in the session by, uh, in the first session on, on Tuesday, that uh, one single quantum computer singled out, uh, which was actually QRS machine, which I found quite surprising, but we do share the, the feeling in the sense that it is a completely new but very promising approach. Uh, what we did was actually first um, tried maximum and reset problems on very simple graphs, moved to a little bit more complex graphs, and at the end of the day tried to optimize the leading path to, to make sure that the results are you know, as stable as it gets. I mean, these are, you know, hand-picked uh, results, so um, take them with a grain of salt, but we do see the, 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 the promise in these machines. Applications are, again, uh, all over uh, BMW when it comes to these combinatorial optimization type problems. One potential example is the following. Um, when, uh, you know, uh, our cars are, um, are built, they need to be moved from the production line to the testing line. This is normally processes done using physical drivers, but can be done automatically if we position sensors along the track where the car is being moved. Uh, turns out that this is a, like, where do you put the sensors is at the end of the day a maximum coverage problem, can be turned into a maximum independent set problem, and, you know, could be used as a toy uh, type of problem for um, the, the algorithms that are just depicted. Since I'm kind of running out of time already a little bit, let us move uh, to another type of example where you know, we come from a very, very clear problem statement and then try to see what quantum can do for us. This is something that we talked about a couple of times already. Um, the use case at hand is a um, TSP type problem in uh, robot path optimization where basically in the production line we need to apply uh, PVC on the underbody of the car in order to seal off basically uh, the convergence of metal sheets. 
it's a complex problem because there, you know, a fleet of robots um, is doing the job. They need to be coordinated. Needs to make sure they don't bump into each other. It's a pretty time-intensive uh, process. So it would be good to save some time. We formalized the problem, tried out all sorts of different quantum algorithms. Turns out it's not at all the right problem fit for quantum computers as of now, and probably won't be in the future for that matter. However, in the process of going through all of that, you know, we were able to formalize the problem. We're able to come up with, you know hybrid type solvers that are more on the classical side, to be honest, but nevertheless um, you know, improved our um, production time by um, uh, about 10%. Right, so very concrete problem statement and then try to venture out in the solution space to find the right uh, fit. Um, so totally different approach to what we saw before. And I'm gonna hand back over to Andre now to put things into perspective a little bit when it comes to you know, the longer vision behind all of these projects. Thank you, Johannes. Okay, so now we saw three very concrete examples, right, that we have think are quantum ready. So now the question is, right, how can we distill all those learnings that we made on the quantum side, right, and give uh, something back to the ecosystem and maybe use them as a way to track the progress that we make over the years, right? Uh, and we do think that application level benchmarks are one important way to do so. Obviously, in, as a complement right, to a hardware level, system level benchmarks, like for example, the quantum volume, we do think application level benchmarks enable us really to put things into an application perspective. Right? If we have a quantum volume of 8,192, I don't know what that means for a specific application with a specific data set with a specific problem formulation, and that's the idea that's behind the Quark framework is because we provide a framework to decompose uh, applications into different layers, right, and use those benchmarks as a guidance um, to move forward. We do have the framework available online and we invite, invite everyone to join or start a repository there, right, there is also some real BMW data. If you are really interested in the underlying models, uh, you can download them there. And that brings us to the end of our presentation, right? Our two-pronged approach. We do think it's important to engage in fundamental research and see how we can apply that at BMW. At the same time, we need to advance you know, our optimization, our machine learning applications, and we work with the ecosystem in order to achieve this. Thank you very much for your attention.